Okay, so one of the major areas of research and practice in the field of psychology is human development. In the past, this tended to mean childhood development, but psychologists are focusing more and more on development throughout the lifespan. This presentation is designed to augment your textbook reading. There will be some information presented here that is not in your text, but this presentation does not replace your need to read the human development chapter in your textbook as there may be some information in the text that is not discussed here. This presentation is also designed to cover two APA standards in this area. The remaining standards are covered in later presentations and activities. So the first thing we need to talk about are the major issues in human development. Essentially, there are three big issues. Nature versus nurture, stages versus continuity of development, and stability versus change. The nature-nurture argument is asking the question, is human development a result of nature, inherited traits, or of nurture, environmental factors? There's been a great deal of research in this area, and the general consensus is it depends. It depends upon which elements of development, for example, physical development, cognitive development, personality, etc. And of course, it's not just one or the other. It's not nature or nurture, but rather a combination of the two in varying degrees. As an example, our genes play a large role in determining height. If a child has tall parents and tall grandparents, they're probably going to grow up to be tall. But if that child is malnourished or contracts a disease that inhibits growth, such as polio, then they will not grow as tall. Genetics sets the course, environment alters it. In varying degrees, the same can be said for cognitive development and personality. Another issue is the debate between stages or continuous development. Essentially, we're asking whether humans go through distinct periods of development or do they develop on a continuous and gradual scale. And once again, the answer is, it depends. There are clearly some biologically, biologically driven periods of development, puberty, menopause, for example, and it's easy to see puberty as a stage of development that is distinctly different from childhood. But careful examination will show that it is, in many ways, simply a continuation of the changes that have been occurring since conception. Our last big issue is that of continuity versus change. And the question here is, do we change as we develop, or are we basically the same throughout the lifespan? And once again, the answer is, it depends. Clearly, biological changes take place, we get bigger and taller, and then later in life smaller and shorter again. As we develop physically, our needs and basic motivations change. Sex and the need for intimacy become increasingly important in early adulthood. Later on, we feel an increased need for safety and security. One might argue that these changes are due to biological changes. This, in turn, influences the life choices that we make. High-risk activities lose their luster of excitement later in life, this then influences one's personality. There's also the influence of external factors. Traumatic event, events can be said to significantly change a person's personality. This may be true, but we must consider that the same traumatic incident may have different effects on different people. A near-death experience may cause one person to become overly cautious. They see high risk in otherwise normal activities, such as driving, and eventually might become a recluse while another person may have had the same experience and decide that life is too short and unpredictable. This person may therefore become very adventuresome, travel the world, engage in high-risk behaviors like bungee jumping and skydiving. In both cases, the external influence changed the person's behavior, but in different ways. Was this difference due to persistent characteristics that, we, that were already present in each person's temperament, that have now just been made more evident and extreme due to the near-death experience. As the Mad Hatter uh, said to Alice, you used to be much more muchier. You've lost your muchness. Uh, perhaps the people in this example are the same, just muchier. Regardless, we do know that there are periods of critical development. Typically, we talk of critical periods only in the very early stages of development. This mostly involves biological development, such as the development of the nervous system in the womb. Anything that affects the normal development of the child during this period will have a dramatic and largely permanent effect. The development of sensory abilities during infancy is a similar critical period. 
external factors um, such as persistently high decibel sounds can have a detrimental impact on an infant's hearing throughout the rest of their life. The impact of critical periods tends to lessen as we age due to neuroplasticity. Now, this is not to say that changes that occur during periods of critical development go away, but rather we develop means by which we can compensate. The child who suffers hearing loss as an infant learns to lip read uh, and becomes more sensitive to vibrations as he or she grows older. So just to make sure that we are all using the same terminology, here are some basic vocab terms. Uh, lifespan refers to the biological limits of life. Obviously, we do not know what any given individual's lifespan will be since the time of death is unknown, but we do know the lifespan of any given species. Life expectancy is the average predicted life of an organism in a given environment. So the human lifespan has not increased in recent decades. Uh, we're still basically the same. But life expectancy has due to changes in the environment. Better sanitation, healthier diet, greater access to health care, for example. The life course is really a sociological term for the expected set of, of events that normally occur throughout an individual's life. Uh, these are often culturally driven and can have an impact on life expectancy, but not on lifespan. So to give an example, uh, according to the latest data, the life expectancy of white women without a college degree in America uh, has dropped in recent years. We can say that this cohort's lifespan is the same as all other humans. Uh, as a group, there's no biological difference between them or any other group of normally developing human beings. But their life expectancy is lower due to factors that they will likely encounter over the life course. Multiple pregnancies combined with lower access to health care, inadequate nutrition, long work hours, lack of sleep, all of these combine to shorten that group's life expectancy. So it is important to understand that current theories in developmental psychology are not based on simple observation or supposition, but on carefully constructed research. All research on development is, by definition, quasi-experimental. Uh, if age or gender is used as an independent variable, the experiment cannot be a true experiment because age and gender cannot be randomly assigned as treatment variables. However, experimental manipulations can be performed to test whether certain conditions have differential impact on different age groups. For example, uh, children in the five to seven year old range may benefit more from auditory instructions in a memory task than visual instructions. If the opposite pattern holds for children in the 9 to 11 year old range, the researcher can infer that children in these age groups acquire information through different cognitive processes. Since this is an interaction between a variable that can be randomly assigned and one that cannot, it is a quasi-experimental design. Research in developmental psychology has its own set of inherent problems that need to be considered. Uh, there are three main concepts underlying research and development. Age, being the chronological age of the individual or the subjects. The cohort, being the historical period in which the individual was born, or the group of individuals were born. So a cohort of people born in 1999, for example. And then the time of measurement, the historic period in which the testing actually takes place. Because any one of these numbers is automatically determined once the other two are known, researchers can never know whether a particular pattern of findings is due to age itself or to, to the historical period, uh, the period of birth or the period of testing. So going back to the previous example, we have to ask, were the recorded differences between the groups due to the difference in their age, six-year-olds compared to ten-year-olds, or was it due to the year in which they were born? In other words, is it visual learning a function of being 10 or a result of having been born in 2001 uh, rather than being born in 2005? Or is it a function of when the testing was conducted? Had the test been done 10 years earlier, obviously on a different cohort, uh, different technologies and procedures might have been used that produced different results. These inherent problems can be controlled for in the experimental design. Developmental psychologists conduct descriptive research in various ways. Each of these methods are used to control for the problems we just identified. 
Uh, by using a cross-sectional method, researchers can compare cohorts of the same age in different locations or environments. That way, we can look at differences between 7-year-olds and 10-year-olds in New York compared to the same cohort in China. This helps us to determine if the observed difference is due to age or some other factor that is location or environment dependent. In a longitudinal study, we follow a single cohort over time. In this way, we can observe the changes that occur in that single cohort as they age. So we're observing the developmental difference between 7-year-olds and 10-year-olds in a single cohort, thereby controlling for differences in birth years between cohorts. Finally, time lag testing allows us to compare different cohorts but control for the time of testing problem by always using the same measure. For example, IQ testing given to 10-year-old students every five years using exactly the same IQ test. For a more complete understanding of developmental changes, we have to use a more complex research design. For example, in the Seattle Longitudinal Study of Adult, adult Intelligence, the researchers followed a number of cohorts over seven-year intervals. They found different patterns of changes in intelligence among cohorts born in different years. Had they followed only one set of individuals over time, rather than repeating the longitudinal analysis, they would have made erroneous conclusions about aging and intelligence. So in this case, they may have followed one group of subjects who were all born in, say, 1970, another group who were born in 1980, and then another group in 1990. They follow each group for the same seven-year period, let's say from 2000 to 2007, uh, thereby controlling for the time of measurement problem, and then compared results both within and between each group, of group or cohort. Uh, this gives the researchers a much more complete understanding of, de of the developmental changes that occur both as a function of aging and as a function of historic time. Another important area of research is in twin studies. By studying identical or monozygotic twins, uh, fraternal or dizygotic twins, and non-twin siblings, researchers hope to gain a better understanding of the impact of environment and heredity. The basic argument was that since monozygotic twins share identical DNA, we can control for heredity. Any differences between the twins, uh, therefore, must be due to differences in the environment. If those identical twins were raised in different environments, uh, for example, they were separated at birth, then we can look at the ways in which the environments were different and ascribe the behavioral differences between the twins to those specific differences in the environment. Conversely, we could look at dizygotic twins who do not share DNA, but who are the same age, thereby controlling for historic time, and are raised in the same environment. Since the age and environment are the same, any differences between them must, therefore, be due to the difference in their DNA, heredity. There are some problems with this concept, though. Uh, we know that only a small minority of monozygotic twins are truly identical. About a quarter of, the, of them are dichorionic, diamniotic, meaning two placentas, two amniotic sacs. The remainder are monochorionic, or diamniotic, one placenta, two amniotic sacs. What this means is that most identical twins actually had different prenatal environments, which could differentially have affected their growth. These differences can persist through life. Another common twin study um, are those which compare identical and same-sex fraternal twins with genetic factors indicated by higher similarity uh, for identical, identical twins over fraternal twins. This type of design is criticized because of the assumption that the identical twins and the, and the fraternal twins both share identical environments because they are reared at the same time when in fact that's not always true. Fraternal twins are often more likely to be treated differently than identical twins. Since the fraternal twins can be different genders, often look at least slightly different, and are known to be non-identical, parents and other friends and relatives will tend to look for differences between them, highlight these differences, and thereby affect the children's development. Conversely, if the twins are known to be identical, uh, they look the same and are of course the same gender, then the expectation is that they should act and think identically, 
This expectation changes the way in which people interact with them, again affecting their development. In the famous Minnesota Twin Study, researchers looked at the impact of heredity and environment on identical twins raised apart. The study was impressive in its findings and very influential in the field, and it is not without its problems. Uh, critics have claimed that the researchers placed too high an emphasis on similarities and disregarded important differences. They also did not allow for the degree to which the monozygotic twins have different prenatal environments. Later researchers have shown that identical twins raised apart are only slightly more alike than any other two siblings raised apart. The similarities between the twins cannot be accounted for in genetics alone. So this brings us to the major theories and theorists in developmental psychology. There are many and more than we have listed here, but these seven are widely discussed and highly influential in the field. Any discussion of theories of human development usually begins with Jean Piaget, uh, the Swiss-born developmental psychologist who developed um, a very thorough theory for cognitive development. Um, Piaget noticed that young children consistently answered the same questions wrong on the Binet intelligence test. This led him to conclude that the cognitive functions of young children was in some way different from that of older children and adults. So, Piaget was defining intelligence first as the ability to adapt to the environment through an equilibration process. Child development involves the child adapting to the environment by using his or her existing ideas about the world and changing those ideas in response to his or her experiences. Piaget also expanded the concept of schema, uh, the way in which we categorize and therefore understand the world around us. Piaget, uh, first of all, said that the schema is a concept or category about the world, that assimilation is the tendency to interpret new experiences in terms of the existing schema, and accommodation are the changes in schema to incorporate information from those new experiences. So to provide an example of this, we have a small child, um, old enough to understand language, uh, maybe can't communicate very clearly, but we have a small child that can understand that there is such a thing as food, and knows the word food. As that child grows and develops, uh, its parents teach it that there is such a thing as healthy food, and there is also such a thing as unhealthy food. So now its concept of food has been broken down into two different categories. This food, this healthy food, and unhealthy food. Which of course begs the question for the child, which is the good food? Well, that child has to then accommodate this new information into its schema and understand that there is food that is good for me, the healthy food, and of course there's food that is good to eat, which as we all know is usually the unhealthy food. So the child has now recategorized or reorganized its concept of food, and in doing so, it also has to then reorganize or change its understanding of the word good. What does good really mean? And so we can see as a child develops and experience, has new experiences, it has to change its concepts of basic words and ideas. According to Piaget, a child's development progresses through four stages, resulting in increases in the child's ability to adapt and to understand the world around it. Piaget framed these stages in terms of problems children can or cannot solve. At each stage, children reorganize their ability to understand the word. It is not that they know less than adults do, it's that they know differently. So Piaget said the first stage of development is the sensory motor stage, from birth to about 18 months. At this stage, the child experiences the world around it through sensory actions, uh, sight, sound, touch. This is uh, why young children, as soon as you put uh, an object in a baby's hand, it immediately goes to its mouth to taste it, uh, to hear it, to see it. Uh, and this is how children interact with the world, not through language. By the pre-operational stage, 18 months to about 7 years, according to Piaget, the child experiences the world through language, um, but with limited logical reasoning. For example, Piaget claimed that if we give a child a basic math problem, say 8 plus 4, it may take that child about 5 seconds to calculate the correct answer of 12. But when asked immediately afterwards, what is 12 minus 4, 
the child cannot simply reverse the problem but needs another five seconds or so to recalculate and figure out that the answer is eight. Later on in the concrete operational stage, the child can do that reversing of the math problem very quickly, almost instantaneously. A child in the pre-operational stage is also uh, still very egocentric. The child believes that whatever it can see, other people can also see. Um, it believes that its understandings of concepts hold true for other people as well. By the concrete operational stage, these phenomena have fully developed or disappeared entirely in the case of egocentrism. Um, by formal operational stage, Piaget claimed that children and adults can perform logical operations. They can solve basic logical problems and think in logical ways. Another very important psychologist in this field was Lev Vygotsky. And despite the fact that Vygotsky died at the early age of 37, uh, this Russian-born psychologist had a large impact on developmental psychology, particularly in the cognitive realm. During the 1920s and 30s, Vygotsky did a lot of work in uh, developing a theory of cognition and memory. And one of the aspects of this theory was the idea of a zone of proximal development. Uh, Vygotsky defined this as the area of knowledge just beyond a child's abilities. According to Vygotsky, children learn best when they encounter information uh, at this level and can interact with a more skilled person. If the new information is beyond this zone, the child cannot possibly understand it or become proficient in using it. Uh, this is why we simply cannot teach a 10-year-old quantum physics. Uh, but Vygotsky claimed that given a skilled teacher who creates an effective framework, what Vygotsky called scaffolding, uh, we can move the child forward in their cognitive development at a faster rate than they would achieve just working independently. This concept has been used to defend educational practices around the world. In addition to Vygotsky's concepts of zone of proximal development and scaffolding, we should also discuss the information processing approach to cognitive development, uh, which proposes that children develop their cognitive abilities in an incremental manner, in some cases corresponding to the development of the brain. Two concepts important in, this, uh, in the information processing approach are metacognition, um, literally thinking about one's own thinking. Uh, children become better at solving problems because they develop more conscious awareness of their own cognitive abilities and can use this awareness to select or change strategies including better knowledge about how to direct their attention and effectively use their short-term or working memories and long-term memory. And secondly, the development is a continuous process. Uh, Vygotsky argued for this by showing that the zone of proximal development moves development forward at a rate consistent with the scaffolding that is provided. Piaget showed that with each new learning, the schema changes and accommodates the new information accordingly. Psychologist Lawrence Kohlberg expanded on Piaget's cognitive development theory by proposing that children's cognitive abilities influence the growth of their ability to make moral judgments. Uh, both argued that moral reasoning develops mainly through interactions with slightly more morally advanced peers. As their cognitive abilities mature, children are able to see the relative pros and cons of different moral positions after they pass the stage of concrete operations. Compared to Piaget's theory, Kohlberg developed these ideas in much more detail, and although there are some controversies associated with both the theory and the research on which it was based, Kohlberg's theory provides a comprehensive framework for understanding how we develop our sense of right and wrong. There were six stages in Kohlberg's theory, but they are more easily um, thought of in terms of three categories into which they fall. Um, although each stage is identified with an age period, it's possible for adults to operate at lower levels of reasoning, and according to Kohlberg, many do. Uh, for example, at the pre-conventional age, young children determine right and wrong in terms just of reward and punishment. So when I ask my six-year-old uh, to go and clean her room, she does this either in hopes of getting a reward afterwards or to avoid punishment, not because she believes that cleaning her room is simply the right thing to do. By middle school uh, age children, moral decisions are made more in terms of laws or general rules. Children at this age are often very sensitive to fairness. 
um, and that rules are rules and they should not be broken in any uh, context. So my other daughter, who's a little bit older, loves to point out when I'm speeding um, that the speed limit is 35 and you should go 35 and cannot really understand that there are some situations when we have to go a little bit more than 35, like when we're late for gymnastics class, for example. Later on, during the post-conventional stage of uh, moral reasoning, decisions about right and wrong are based on the notion of moral relativity, um, that sometimes a law should be broken. Uh, as Martin Luther King so eloquently said, uh, there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate uh, obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a morally respons responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. This concept cannot truly be grasped by a child until they are in the post-conventional morality stage, according to Lawrence Kohlberg. According to the Danish psychologist Eric Erikson, development occurs as a series of changes in in the abilities of the ego or the rational component of personality. Uh, like Piaget, Erickson proposed a set of stages, but he did not intend that the stages be understood as steps in a ladder. Instead, he maintained that people can grapple with any psycho psychosocial issue at any age. Uh, to understand Erickson's theory correctly, um, you should understand his original matrix as shown here. Uh, rather than just the names of the stages alone, um, what Erickson was trying to show was that the diagonal in this matrix, the diagonal across the matrix, um, represents the usual expected pattern of psychosocial development because people are most likely to confront these issues when they are in that particular age period. However, Erickson also proposed that people could confront, confront psychosocial issues in the off-diagonal portions of the matrix because the issues are not intrinsically linked to age or portion of life. Erickson identified eight stages of psychosocial development and argued that development is dependent upon a tension within a di this dichotomy. Uh, the two opposing forces change throughout life, pulling and pushing development accordingly. Uh, you should take the time to memorize the stages and the opposing forces acting on the individual at each stage. These are presented to you in your textbook. Uh, please take the time to read this carefully and understand how these forces work and how each subsequent stage is dependent upon uh, the previous. According to British psychologist Don, uh, John Balby, uh, children develop an inner representation of their relationships with their primary caregiver. This inner representation or working model becomes the basis for their subsequent adult relationships. Dr. Balby's work became the basis for the research by another American psychologist, Mary Ainsworth, who devised an experimental situation to assess a child's attachment style. In this experiment, called the, the strange situation, young children play in a room with their mother. The mother leaves the room and then returns. The experimenter rates the child's reaction both when she leaves the room and when she returns. The attachment styles are either securely attached, the, the child seems disturbed but not distressed when the mother leaves and greets her happily when she returns, or insecurely attached. The child may or may not become anxious or distressed when the mother leaves the room and may either ignore her or be ambivalent about physical contact when she returns. Later researchers have shown there may be a third um, or another reaction to insecure attachments um, when the child may react with anger or sometimes violently on the, upon the mother's return. Harry Harlow's famous monkey experiment showed this process quite effectively. Young monkeys, when raised with only wire mothers uh, that provided only nourishment but no comfort, had considerable developmental problems throughout life. 
these monkeys were much less likely to explore a strange environment than their peers who had been raised with a cloth mother that provided nourishment and comfort. The monkeys that had experienced physical comfort showed secure attachment, while those that had not showed only insecure attachment. Harlow's experiment and Balby and Ainsworth's findings then beg the question, how great a role do child-rearing practices play in human development? Several studies have shown that children with the highest or healthiest rates of self-esteem, self-reliance, and social competence usually have warm, concerned, and authoritative parents. So first let me say that it would be unfair to categorize all parents into just one of these three styles. Typically, parents move between these styles at different times and in different situations. Even so, it is useful to discuss overall parenting style as a function of one of these forms. If a parent relies more heavily on either the authoritarian style, in which rules are established but no explanation provided, or a permissive style, where the children's demands are always met, the child tends to develop lower levels of self-esteem, reliance, and competence. This is largely due to the fact that these two styles, authoritarian and permissive, both deny the child an adequate understanding of the world around them. As developmental psychology has shown, the human brain strives for understanding, uh, for ways in which to effectively function in its environment. If the child asks why they must follow the rules, and they are told, because I told you so, or because I said so, that child has not learned anything uh, that is useful for understanding its environment. Perhaps the only thing that they have learned is that their primary caregiver is not a source of useful information. They will then turn to other sources for that information, and too often those other sources do not have the child's best interests in mind. This same can be said for the overly permissive parenting style. Always giving in to a child's demands or simply allowing the child to do as it pleases may inadvertently send the message that the parent does not really care for the child. The child also learns nothing useful from this parenting style and can become unaware of social norms or expected behaviors. The authoritative style in which rules are provided, applied, and explanations given is the only parenting style that informs the child, thereby helping the child to grow and learn. It is important to note that the model that is provided here and the observations of these psychologists may be culturally dependent. Other parenting styles may actually work better in different cultures, and this is certainly an area of further study. This question of culture brings us to our last two developmental psychologists, Uri Bronfenbrenner and Paul Baltis. Bronfenbrenner proposed a model in which the social environment exerts both direct and indirect influence on child development. He identified five systems that impact uh, child development. The microsystem, um, the, the close environment, the child's family, the home, uh, peers, the school, the neighborhood, the child's relationship with those things. The mesosystem, the relationships between elements of the microsystem, so how the parents get along with each other. The exosystem, the experiences in a social setting in which an individual does not have an active role but still exert influence over the child's development. The macro system, which are the ideologies, the values of the culture in which the individual grows. And the chrono system, the patterning of environmental events and transitions over the life course. Um, so to give an example of this, um, here we have a, a person, ego, um, that is developing. And in this case, the microsystem is the relationship with the mother and father. The mesosystem is the relationship between the mother and father. Uh, if do the, do the mother and father um, have a close, loving relationship in a single household? Um, are they ambivalent towards each other? Is there tension between the mother and father? Um, are they divorced, living separately? Is the father currently serving time for physically assaulting the mother? All of these different types of relationships are going to have an impact on ego's development. The exosystem are other factors that the child does not play an active role in, but still impact the child's development. For example, uh, the father loses his job, um, and that job loss is going to have an economic impact on the child and on the entire family, but it's not anything that the child plays an active role in. The macro system 
is the culture. Um, for example, the American focus on competition over cooperation. Um, that's going to have an impact on how this child develops and the values that that child develops. And then the Kronos system being the time period in which all of this is happening. So, for example, uh, women's increasing access to work in the 20th century. In our situation here, if the father loses his job, it's entirely reasonable that the mother may find a job and become the primary breadwinner in the, uh, in the household. That is going to have a, a different impact on ego's development again. So this is basically, this is Bronfen Brenner's um, uh, ecological systems theory. Paul Baltus argued for a multidimensional and multidirectional model in which three social influences affect development. The age-graded normative influences, which are the expectations associated with specific ages reflected in a given culture. What exactly do we expect 10-year-olds to be able to do? How do we expect them to act? History-graded normative influences, the effects of living in a given time and place that have similar influences on people within that society. And then normative influences, random, unpredictable influences that are idiosyncratic to each individual. Um, the attacks of 9-11 are a great example, how that has changed people's perceptions of the world around them. So to try and give a visual representation of Balta's model, here again we have ego, um, and we can talk about the age-graded normative influences um, that as this person grows and develops from, let's say, you know, 0 to 98, the expectations of how they should act and what they should be able to do will change, so the movement will be in this direction. We can talk about history-graded normative influences. As times change, as the, the years tick by, the culture changes and therefore the behaviors of the individual change, much like in Bronfenbrenner's um, idea of Kronos system. And then the non-normative influences, those unexpected events that cannot be predictive that are going to in some way influence that person. And if we think about it in this way, we can think about ego's development in three dimensions rather than just two dimensions. So that as ego develops, he moves through this space as a function of these three different influences. So in summary, uh, the study of human development is based on sound scientific study beyond simple everyday observation. Various theories exist that help us to explain developmental changes. And the field of developmental psychology is a process through which we observe development, rather than a finished product that fully explains human development.